first speaker is Alberto Ibot, and he is going to talk about quantum fields and Schwinger's picture of quantum mechanics. Please. Okay, so thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Well, first I have to just uh, uh, congratulate again, Bal, and also just as a little uh, uh, comment about our long relationship. We met in 1995 in Vienna, probably Bal, you remember. And I was, was puzzled by, I mean, impressed by your inquisitive mind. I remember when we were sharing lunch in this, in the mess room at the Rodinger Institute that you were asking and commenting about all kinds of issues, either scientific or political or whatever. I remember one day I was, for whatever reason, I was supposed to know something about Donaldson's theory. And you immediately started to ask me, all sorts of questions about the implications for physics, for instance, of the exotic structures of structures on R4. Of course, I couldn't say I just could mumble something. And fortunately, I was out of the hook because immediately your attention shifted to something else. And uh, But later on, as uh, we kept uh, discussing and talking in many occasions when you were visiting Madrid about non-commutative space times and many other things. So. Well, it has been a wonderful, uh, long relation, and I hope to keep it going on. Today, I was choosing to talk about something that we have been commenting and elaborating and trying to understand very hard in the last few years, and is this, uh, I mean, the implications of exploiting better the stronger picture of quantum mechanics. I'm sorry, I'm going to step on a little, step in a little bit on Giuseppe Marmo's talk, but it could be good because, I mean, whenever you change or try to make up uh, some to, to do something different concerning the foundations of our uh, craft, uh, it's hard and takes a lot of effort for people to move from their uh, comfort zone. And so it's good to insist and to approach from various perspectives. So this is more or less essentially the uh, mm, uh, the summary of my talk. First, I'm going to comment a little bit about Schwinger's picture of quantum mechanics and its relation with Feynman's vision of quantum mechanics, trying to elaborate and to understand in what sense Feynman's picture of quantum mechanics also mm, can be also put in the same mathematical framework as uh, Schwinger's picture of quantum mechanics. And from there, I will try to move into something that we have been working the last, say, uh, couple of years on extending, or at least to mm, trying to understand also uh, the description of relativistic quantum field theories using these ideas. So what is all this about? Mm, well, as uh, Beppe was explaining the other day, mm, uh, mm, the main or one of the main aspects of quantum physics was the consideration of the putting into the uh, mind of physicists the notion of transitions, quantum jumps. And this was an integral and fundamental ingredient in the development of the theory by, uh, by Heisenberg, Bohr, but not only them, also by uh, uh, Schwinger. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, Swinger was also uh, mm, mm, taking the point of the, the comment by Beppe the other day, the, one of the main contributions of mathematics in the, uh, to, to mathematics uh, and mathematics in science in the last century was the abstraction mm, of uh, concrete models. And in this sense, uh, Swinger was again uh, anticipating this point of view. And just let me quote the, uh, the statement in the beginning of his book on quantum kinematics and dynamics that stating that the laws of atomic physics must be expressed in a non-classical mathematical language that constitutes a symbolic expression of the properties of microscopic measurements. This look, this abstraction of uh, explicit models is what lies behind the introduction of the notion of group points to describe exactly that, to incorporate into the picture of elementary or fundamental, a fundamental or primary description of physics, 
the notion of transitions. So in this sense, the groupoidal picture of quantum mechanics that we have been elaborating consists of a very few axioms that says that when we provide an experimental setting to describe a physical system, we will obtain outcomes, A, B, X, Y, that belongs to some set, here denoted by capital omega. And what we will be also observing and studying will be the transitions hmm, suffered by the system hmm, that will be described or better uh, denoted in this categorical notation hmm, like alpha that will describe or will be representing the transition suffered by the system that will provide or that will take the system from the outcome A into the outcome B or from the outcome X into the outcome Y and so on. These transitions must satisfy uh, or they can be composed in uh, uh, mm, mm, uh, and the composition from the perspective of the experimenter is just the concatenation of them. This destruction of this composition law, which is a partial composition law, satisfies a number of, so to speak, natural or fundamental axioms like the associativity property, which is, which are, I mean, these properties are listed here on the right hand side of the screen. The existence of units, that means transitions that do not, that do nothing to the system. And the most important one from the point of view, from the structural point of view, is the existence of the inverse transition. And that reflects, so to speak, a fundamental microscopic reversibility of uh, the observations we do. Of course, all this together is what we call nowadays a group oil, and it could be perfectly well be called a group, because groups are particular instances of group oil where there are only just one unit. And all transitions can be composed, right? So group points extend in a natural way the notion of groups, and they are the natural categorical setting to describe in a symbolic way the observations that we perform, that we get or we achieve on quantum systems, or by, the, by that matter, on any physical system. Simple examples of group points hmm, correspond, for instance, to um, systems which have a discrete finite output uh, outputs and for instance the astral qubit is described by this groupoid also the, uh, drawn by Giuseppe Marmor last uh, Friday that can be also described more um, abstractly by the <coughs> uh, uh, the killing diagram A2 and so on the harmonic oscillator will correspond to this infinite diagram and the transitions will be the ones which are written there. There is plenty of examples and situations that have been analyzed and discussed in our papers along the last few years. And so I'm not going to insist on that. What I would like to say is a couple of, I'm not going to insist also neither on the construction of the starting with a groupoid on the other ingredients needed to provide a meaningful physical theory, like the notion of states, observables, dynamical evolution, etc., that Giuseppe, Mar Giuseppe Marmor was commenting on hmm, with some explicit examples last time. I'm just going to say a couple of words about the basis of one of the first ingredients towards a um, substantial uh, statistical interpretation of a theory uh, starting with such an astral uh, setting. And this statistical interpretation will start by extending the notion of probability spaces as they were conceived by Kolmogorov. Hmm? That means uh, mm, probability space of what I would like to call Kolmogorov space is just a set omega with a sigma algebra of sets B and a probability measure capital P. This mm, notion of uh, this fundamental notion that uh, has been extremely successful to model the description of system whose outputs are random, hmm, which are uh, mm, uh, has been extended for completely different purposes to the category of groupoids by a number of different 
uh, currents of thought, like the one initiated in the 50s, the 60s by Mackey and Han, Moore and others, but in a completely different way and direction and motivation by Alain Cohn in the 70s too. And this came as, for instance, in the uh, conceptualization by Cohn, <clears throat> the extension of the of the notion that uh, of uh, mm, probability, uh, the interpretation of probability, the probabilities in the context of Rupois was called by him non-commutative integration theory. Was a mm, nice report in uh, was quoted is quoted at the bottom of the slide by him. In any case, what I'm simply saying is that the ex natural extension of the notion of probability, or probability of space, is what we call today a measure groupoid, which is a groupoid, gamma over omega, and which is carrying a measure, and this measure <coughs> satisfies some natural consistency properties, and is the first one is that it can be decomposed along the natural mm, maps covered by the group point, the source and the target map corresponding to any transition, mm, following the formula, which is uh, written on the right-hand side on the screen, so that new, the measure is going to be the integral of a family of measures with support along the fibers of the source of the target map, mm, uh, times the probability on some probability distribution, some probability measure along the space of outcomes, the basis of the groupoid. Such uh, measures, such family of measures, such functions with values in measures, that was what uh, Alain Cohn was calling a, a transverse function, where Mm, has to be equivariant, has to be compatible with the action of the groupoid on the left, or on the right. Mm, and this is what is expressed in the equation in the middle of the screen. On the other hand, this notion of uh, the groupoid was exploited in an indirect way by the seminal and fundamental construction of von Neumann, von Neumann's construction of the theory of algebras of operators, what we call today the theory of von Neumann algebras or in a more general, in, in, or more generally, C star algebras. So in particular, a natural measure groupoid hmm, that is going to be discussed and elaborated further hmm, by uh, Fabio Di Cosmo in the lecture following mine, hmm, it will consist of a group acting on a probability space and this such an action can be, it's just a particular instance of a groupoid. The groupoid will consist on the Cartesian product of the group G, capital G times omega, with source and target maps given just by the source of the pair corresponding to the element G on the group and the element X on omega is going to be X, and the target is going just to be just a transform of X by G. The composition law in this, the partial composition law in this groupoid is the one expressed on the right hand side, so that it will have the pair gx, which is composed with another pair g prime y, where y, in order to be composable with the previous pair, should be the transformation, should be the target of the first one. So this means gx and leading to the pair g prime g, comma x, the transform. Mm, uh, reflecting the transformation, the action of the group on the space of outcomes. So, uh, in particular, if omega p is a probability space, a Kolmogorov of space, and g is a locally compact group, then, and the action is measurable, the, and, and, and the measure p is quasi invariant, then immediately we got that the total groupoid, the action groupoid, is a measure a groupoid. This construction, as I was telling you before, is was the mm, key stone for von Neumann's construction of all uh, uh, to explore the theory of factors, the classification of the structure of von Neumann algebras that was completed by, uh, well, successfully 
uh, developed by Alain Kohn in the uh, ending with that uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, so I'm, as I was telling you before, I'm not going to elaborate further into the um, construction of the von Neumann algebra of a groupoid, the algebra of a groupoid that will be represented the algebra of observables, the notion of states, and all the other uh, um, uh, details that, it's, that are extremely important to understand the foundations of quantum mechanics from which we can recover after um, some elaborations that various standard pictures of quantum mechanics, mm, essentially arriving either to the Dirac von Neumann, whatever picture based on Hilbert spaces, operators, and so on and so, or the algebraic picture of quantum mechanics based on the notion of algebras, star algebras, C star algebras of operators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm not going to elaborate on that. I want to move into the direction of because once we got here and we recover the fundamental statements of, so to speak, the, funda the, the standard pictures of quantum mechanics, you may say, so what? Hmm? What can we do with, uh, with all that? Mm, uh, can we mm, have a new understanding of at least, uh, uh, can we solve some of the uh, problems raised by the foundational interpretation of quantum mechanics using these ideas? Well, the answer is that uh, maybe we can actually we have been working in this direction too but then we like to show you something for people which are more so to speak interested in the developments of the second half of the previous century towards the construction of our current understanding of fundamental interactions using field theories or quantum field theories so let me actually the, the, the main motivation by Schwinger when he was doing this refundation or this uh, re-elaboration of the foundations of quantum mechanics was to provide a solid ground to construct his uh, derivation of quantum electrodynamics, starting mm, what we call today Schwinger's dynamical principle, Schwinger's variational principle, and which can be written as follows. If, we de if I denote by phi, sub B T1, A T2, the transition amplitude, the amplitude corresponding for the transition from some state which is uh, attached or which is sitting in a Hilbert space corresponding to say a Cauchy hypersurface mm, at time T0 and B T1 is some state as is drawn in the picture on the side of the formula sitting on a, Hilbert, on a Hilbert space, which is sitting on a Cauchy hypersurface determined by time T1 on space-time, M you may imagine, which is just Minkowski space-time, then the variation of the transition amplitude can be written, but this is the content of Schunger dynamical principle, as the valuation among these two states of the variation of the integral of a Lagrangian operator, ball phase L, hmm, uh, that is characteristic of the theory we are describing. On the other hand, Feynman's approach to the same problem, hmm, describing the transition amplitudes, describing the interaction or the evolution of whatever phenomena we are studying, is uh, provided by a path integral formula. So this transition amplitude, in particular now Q0 and Q1 are configurations of mechanical system in the case of quantum mechanics, there will be fields in the case of field theories. Mm -hmm. the, so the transition amplitude, mm -hmm. Q1, Q1 with respect to Q0, Q0 can be evaluated as the integral of an all path connecting Q0, T0, Q1, Q1 of E times, sorry, E exponentiated to I, the action of Mathcal, the calligraphic L, which is the classical Lagrangian. So of the theory we are describing. So in these two approaches, you see that the Lagrangian appears in two completely different ways. In Feynman's dynamical principle, the Lagrangian that we have to consider is a classical Lagrangian, which is evaluated on classical configurations or classical fields. Why? In Schwinger's dynamical principle, the Lagrangian that appears there is a quantum operator. It's an operator 
which is constructed out of quantum operators in its uh, elaboration of the theory, they were really formal objects mm, satisfying algebraic relations. So what is the precise relation between these two formulations? Why do they, I mean, one of the, uh, mm, mm, as far as I know, there is not a satisfactory answer to why the two ways of understanding the fundamental dynamical structure of quantum field theories uh, are the same, apart from the constatation, from the uh, checking that they lead, or they con they uh, you will, we got the same predictions, the same uh, perturbative expansions in the per in the particular instance of quantum electrodynamics, where uh, which is the by actually the only instance where Schwinger dynamical principle has been used in its full uh, strength, in its full glory. So, for instance, this is one of the, let me say, foundational problems that I would like or we would like to understand better, and is what is the relation between the path integral formulation, the relativistic Lagrangian uh, approach to quantum field theories by Feynman, and the use of Schwinger dynamical principle in the same end. Uh, in order to understand this question, groupoids are very helpful. Or the groupoidal picture or the Schwinger's picture in terms of groupoids of modern mathematical language is quite helpful. So let me show that Feynman's picture of quantum mechanics is also groupoidal. And for in doing that, I can be done in various ways. I could use some discretization of the path integral as it is presented in the standard textbooks and papers. But let me approach from a different perspective. And actually, the notion of path in Feynman corresponds to the choice of uh, a clock within the experimental equipment carried by the observer. So uh, as Einstein was insisting, hmm, the experimental setting that we uh, start or we create in order to describe whatever we are describing consists that you carry a clock with you. And for us, a clock is just, can be this idea, this notion can be made more precise, but at this stage it's, Irrelevant, and for me or for us, a clock will be just any reference system. In particular, you can choose a reference system whose outcomes are real numbers, and the simplest possible one is the groupoid of pairs. So let's consider that a clock is just the groupoid of pairs, R times R, so pairs of real numbers with the standard composition map, with source and target, the uh, corresponding entries of the pair ST. The dynamics is not important at this stage. The dynamics here could be that of the harmonic oscillator or could be the harmonic oscillator together with a ratchet that, transform, that will transform the periodic outcome of the dynamic of the harmonic oscillator, the values R we will record in here, into some linear mm, sequence of numbers. Uh, most important is that if we have a clock, in order for this clock to be meaningful within our experimental setting, there should be a time map. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean a map from the groupoid gamma that is describing the outputs, the outputs and the transitions of our system into the clock in the sense that any output of the system, let me call it A, will be mapped into some specific value T of A that will be the reading by the clock. And also, if we have a transition alpha from A to B, then it will, this time map of time detection map will be giving you two numbers, T A, T B, there will be the times where, uh, at which the transition starts and at which the transition begins. The difference T B minus T A would be the, uh, the length of the transition. Uh, this time map should be a homomorphism of group point because it should be consistent, right? This means that if we have two transitions, the corresponding readings of the clock will correspond to the uh, composition of the corresponding transitions. So um, the time map should be a homomorphism of group points. Also in the language of categories, it's just a functor between the two group points. Such homomorphism will give rise to a short sequence sorry, to a short exact sequence of groupoids. We will have the kernel of this map 
and there will be a normal subgroupoid of gamma, very much like in the standard theory of groups. And uh, this sequence of groupoids could be, in principle, mm, will define an extension, mm, could be read in the terminology, in the uh, spirit of extensions of groups, saying that our groupoid, that remember represents our experimental setting, is an extension of the clock, the group point C, by the group, the group point curve D, the kernel of the time map. Let me call this group point K or kappa. Uh, <clears throat> but there is something else. Clocks, in order to be meaningful, they have to be part of the experimental setting. So they are carried for us and we use them in order to synchronize everything with them. So they interact mm, mm, with the system. So they are subsystems of the overall system. So in this sense, clocks, mm, in the, the, since the moment which are being incorporated as, as a part of the system we are mm, studying, they are subgroupoids of the total groupoid. So let me call W this map, this injective homomorphism from the clock C into the group point, so that, for instance, to any T being a homomorphism to any outcome of the clock, so to any time, it will associate an outcome of the system, gamma, let me call it gamma of T, and to any transition of the clock, so to any span of time given by two times T and S, there will be a transition, hmm? Uh, corresponding in the actual development, hmm, evolving of our system will be a transition from the trans from the outcome that will be transforming the outcome gamma of s at time s into the outcome at time t. This fact and the consistency condition for clocks that would should be that the readings provided by the clock hmm, compose with or better the uh, the homomorphism describing how the clock is a subsystem of the total system together with the time map should provide identity. This means that this shorter subsequence that I was writing before splits because W now is a homomorphism, which is a cross section of the homomorphism D. A split sequences in the case of groups, they are what we call semi, they this implies, in the case of group, the gamma is a semi-direct product of the two groups. In the case of group, the theory is a little bit more complicated, but you can extend the notion of semi-direct products of groupoids, the sorry, of groups to the category of groupoids, and some comments in this direction and a few uh, technical results are, are contained in the in our contribution to the the uh, book honoring Baal in this occasion. So I'm not going to insist on that. For instance, the simplest possible case will be the gamma will be the Cartesian product of the direct product, we will say, of a group of kappa times the clock C. But this uh, product can be twisted, hmm? very much like what happens with uh, semi-direct products. And this is a situation that will be important later on in the development of relativistic quantum field theories. So what we got after this discussion about the role of clocks and their interpretation within the groupoidal or Schwinger's picture of quantum mechanics is that we have histories that corresponds to the actual development of a clock within the system we are studying, which are described by homomorphisms, functors, W from the clock or the groupoid of pairs, as it is written here now, P of R, R the real numbers, if the clock we are considering into the uh, uh, into the groupoid, into the total groupoid describing the system. And this homomorphism of groupoids can be described by using a single map just observing the following obvious identity. W of Ts equals, I'm reading the formula immediately uh, below the notion of homomorphism. So the transition that takes you from uh, time S to time T is can be written as W of the composition of the system going from 
time s to t time t zero compose with time t zero to time t, because the composition of these two pairs, the groupoid of pairs is just t s. But this um, w being a homomorphism is the composition now of the transition determined by w from s to t zero with the transition corresponding to the time t zero to t. And because of the inversion property, W of T0S or of T0 is the inverse of T0S. So any element, any transition WST from time S into time T, I'm always reading time backwards in the, uh, 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 from right to left, is going to be the composition of the transition from some reference time T0 to T that has been composed on the right with the inverse of the transition from D0 to S. So we can identify, or we can, uh, yeah, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between histories, hmm, these functors, and what uh, the technical name for that are gamma paths. It means maps, which are uh, mapping some concrete specific interval, T0, T1, for instance, into the groupoid and such that they start at T0 in the corresponding unit, the unit of the element X, uh, is zero, and has such that the transition hmm, hmm, that is actually observed is, uh, course, it's just W better. This, this gamma path W sub T0, X0 at S is just the transition W from T0 at, uh, to the time S. There is a natural composition law between this uh, gamma path hmm, that uh, satisfies, which is written downstairs, da down in the, the slide. And that is obviously, I mean, can be checked easily, which is, is associative. There are units. So the family of gamma path, they form or they constitute a category. Hmm. Uh, uh, actually, our... yes, please. Yeah, have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes oh, more. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, 10 minutes more. Okay, thank you for the reminder. Uh, so these paths, they form a category. Mm -hmm. And a such category can be groupoidified. I mean, there is a minimal groupoid containing such category. The way to do that is a, a standard construction in category theory that also in group theory, I mean, whenever you have any family of uh, elements of, of uh, sorry, of, uh, yeah, of elements and relations, you can generate a group from that, which is the free group generated by uh, this family of elements subjected to these relations. Exactly the same happens here. So the bottom line of all that is that there is a groupoid hmm, uh, that extends in a natural way the family of histories and is what we can call the groupoid of histories of our uh, quantum system. In particular, when the quantum system is just the pair groupoid of a configuration space, Q times R times Q times R, where Q is a configuration space, this notion of uh, histories recovers the notion of paths in Feynman's formalism. Uh, I'm going, I can, I could uh, discuss further the connection with uh, Feynman's theory. For that, I will have to elaborate a little bit on uh, Dirac, what we call Dirac Feynman Schwinger states, and which this is where the role of the Lagrangian of the action will appear. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to jump onto that because I want to concentrate on uh, the extension from quantum mechanics to field theory, right? So I'm going to skip these two slides and uh, we have, we can read about that in some of our papers, which have been uh, quoted on the bottom of the slides and passing. There is some interesting issues about the general representation of this, what we so-called uh, Dirac Feynman Schwinger states that are essentially the dynamical content of the theory. But uh, I prefer to skip this. Well, at the, at the end, we will got a general formula for the uh, transition amplitude in Feynman's presentation, but from this groupoidal approach, 
when we will get the, the Feynman's transition amplitude will be the integral with respect to some measure on this uh, groupoid of histories of the exponential of the i times the action corresponding to now the Lagrangian. But the Lagrangian is a function, it's an element in the groupoid. Hmm? Sorry, it's a function in the groupoid. So it has this non-commutative character because the functions in the groupoid, they determine that they define a, uh, uh, a non-commutative algebra hmm, that will generate the von Neumann algebra of the groupoid. So in this sense, this L, this, this, this script L that appears in the formula that I'm writing down, can have, is, is dual in, in, in the sense that on one side is a function, very much like uh, Feynman wrote, but at the same time is an element in a non-commutative algebra. So it's mm, up, uh, uh, after a representation, it will become an operator mm, as uh, in Schwinger uh, theory. So let me just say a few words before my time runs out on the covariant relativistic picture of this, uh, 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 of, of the notions before. So, and in order to do that, what the first thing we have to realize or to, or to notice is that there is nothing special about clocks. You can, the clocks in the sense that I was telling before, we can replace a clock like the one that I was writing before, R times R, by any, by more general reference systems. In particular, another reference system that we can use is a frame. Frame here is not, is, is, is mm, sorry by the, mm, the collision of terminologies, uh, it's nothing not related with the notion of frames in general relativity or anything that is for, for us, of, for me here, a frame is just mm, a system, which is the pair of root points of, of, of a given space time. So what I mean by that <coughs> is that we can conceive that together with a clock, we use other family of detectors, for instance, or uh, systems of determining distance, uh, systems for determining distances, like laser uh, gauges and things like that. And we will determine that the outcomes of all this uh, elaboration of all this preparation corresponds to coordinates of what we will abstractly determine or denote as a space time. So for us, this script M will be, a, for instance, a globally hyperbolic space time, for instance, Minkowski space time, if you wish. And this will be the natural extension of the notion of a clock. And this is what we do, what we will use when we will do field theories. So together as uh, the same arguments leading before to the notion of histories will apply here. And then we will ask if the, this frame that we are using to support our experimental setting to discuss, for instance, the scattering of two electrons, is working properly, there should be a map, what we call before the time map, now should be something that will detect hmm, where, for instance, the test particles we are using to explore or to study the properties of our system hmm, are. And so this map, capital D, will be a map from the groupoid describing the system into my frame, into the this Cartesian product of n times a. So in particular, to any outcome of the system, for instance, uh, 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 the position, they will correspond a position, hmm? there could be other outcomes of the system, like a spin or others, they will correspond a position in a space time. So A will be mapped into a point, hmm? uh, an event in a space time, X sub A. Now I will denote it by pi of A, because I'm going to use a notation that will be more appealing. And any transition in the groupoid describing the, uh, any transition that we will observe corresponding to the, the system we are studying will determine two outcomes, XA, XB in the system. This map should be a homomorphism of groupoids. And in particular, it will provide this bundle, this map, this projection from the space of outcomes of the total groupoid into the space-time we are considering. This map could be anything. And 
Now, for mathematical ingenuity, we will consider that this BAP is a bundle projection. So that is a bundle structure, a locally trivial Faber bundle. This is really not necessary, but it's in all in, 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 in all relevant, important applications and significant uses, most of the cases, this is what happens. So for instance, omega over m is going to be a vector bundle or a principal bundle or any other bundle. Again, as in the case of clocks, we will have now a short attack sequence of groupoids. Now the, mm, the total groupoid will be an extension of the frame provided by the space time we are working with or we are working in and by the kernel of this map by some other group point K, capital K. The same time, as I was as I was arguing in the case with in the case with clocks, now all the experimental setting that allows us to talk about the frame, this means the space time, they are subsystem of the total system. And this means that they are, the groupoid describing them is a subgroupoid of the total groupoid. Mm? This subgroupoid will be described by a functor, a homomorphism of groupoid from P of M into gamma. That should be consistent with the detection map. So this means that W should be a cross section of D. So in this sense, again, the short exact sequence that I'm writing here is going to be a semi-direct product, it's going to define a generalized semi-direct product of P of M by a group point. In particular, in the simplest possible situation, you may consider that the gamma is going to be the Cartesian product of PM with another group point. Uh, Can you please summarize in next five minutes or so? Yes, I'm, I'm going to do that. So uh, in this sense, uh, I'm, I'm finishing my presentation. The because yeah, it's my time. Uh, these histories, these functors, they will define sections of the bundle, and these are classical fields of the theory. At the same time, we can construct concrete representations of these functors that will correspond to the histories, hmm, to the gamma path I was describing before. These oriented histories, they will be they will be determined a groupoid of histories, hmm, uh, and this group point of histories could be used to construct explicit representation for the transition amplitude in the sense of Schwinger. And, and this is again the formula that will describe the transition amplitude from the field phi zero at a Cauchy hypersurface sigma zero and with respect to the Field phi one on the Cauchy surface is sigma one as a path integral, as an integral over all transitions carrying from V0 to V1 e to the power of I the action, with L being a Lagrangian function that will be a function on the group point. So in this sense, both pictures, Feynman and Schwinger are unified. And this is the departing point to explore and to go further and to to study particular or concrete uh, uh, field theories provided by specific choices of the groupoids involved and the Lagrangian. This is the, su the subject we are working uh, on, and I hope I could provide more um, results and uh, we can provide with more interesting results in the coming times. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, I will stop here my talk and I just simply congratulate again uh, Val uh, and, and uh, we celebrate his uh, wonderful uh, friendship. So thank you very much. Thank you. If there is, yeah, Val has a question. First, a very nice talk, Alberto. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Val. You have developed much more than what happened five years ago. That's good. Mm -hmm. but, uh, also, thanks for the augury. Uh, thanks. Sec but I want to know, you said the functions on a groupoid form a non-commutative algebra. Exactly. The product, and what is the star? The is product it, is, a, is, a, is a convolution product. Hmm. Hmm. So, I see. Okay. so you have a groupoid, you, you may think in groups, right? Because 
groups and particular instances of, of group points. So you have a group, then the algebra, fu the, the functions of the group, they close under, uh, under the, they, clo the, they form a non commutative algebra under convolution product, right? And with this algebra, you can construct a von Neumann algebra associated to the group. Exactly the same ideas are involved in the case of group points, right? So starting with a groupoid as a fundamental description of the experimental setting describing a quantum system, you immediately, among quotes, you get a von Neumann algebra. Mm -hmm. This von Neumann algebra, in general, will not be a factor. Mm -hmm. It will be, mm, will decompose as a direct integral of factors. Mm -hmm. And mm, in, in the simplex examples in quantum mechanics, the factors you got are type one. But, and this is uh, the kind of question that you will immediately, uh, will come to your mind, when you go to the, his, the, the, the history description of quantum mechanics emerging from this, so this group point of histories, the question is what are the fact, what, what, are, uh, what are the structure of the von Neumann algebras corresponding to this group point of histories? Well, my conjecture is that they are going to have they are going to be type three, very much like the well-known theorem in algebraic quantum field theory. Hmm? Uh, question is, I don't see the connection of these functions to observe local observables in algebraic quantum field theory. I don't see it. Okay? And it should be type three one okay, or hyperfinite type three one. Yes. I see. Is this a modular category? What you got? Uh, the, the 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 local observables in in algebraic quantum field theory they are they are going to be so to speak generated they are elements of the corresponding uh, algebra right so the 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 they will correspond to functions on the group point of histories that I was commenting before so starting so to speak with a um, group point the acronal picture of the system. You will construct a groupoid of histories or the groupoid of configurations in the case of field theories. And the functions in that groupoid will be the local observables. Well, the ones which are self adjoint, of course, in the case of algebraic quantum field theories. Uh, hi, Alberto. But, this is uh, Sachin. I have. Yes. Hi, Sachin. Uh, so, uh, have you thought about how you would describe, uh, say, uh, some interesting non-perturbative phenomena in this uh, groupoid language? And specifically, what I have in mind is uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and anomalies. So, do you have any ideas on how you would uh, attack these non-perturbative questions? Yes. Uh, mm, anomalies. In the case of anomalies, I don't expect anything, so to speak, uh, novel with respect to the phenomena that, that arises or, or how do they arise in a standard presentation of... Uh, uh, notice that this way of thinking is going to provide, uh, as particular instances, the standard presentations of quantum field theories, both in the Feynman or in the Swinger picture, right? So, uh, mm, uh, the case of anomalies that will correspond to uh, the mm, breaking of the invariance of the measure theoretical description in the, in, in, in the, in the model. So, in this case, uh, in the groupoid of histories, we will have to construct, in order to make it into a measure groupoid, we will have to construct, to introduce a measure there. We are working on that, actually, how to do that. Actually, Fabio is going to talk after me. He's very much involved into that. Uh, and uh, one of the sources for anomalies will be that this measure that we will construct in the groupoid of configurations of histories will not be uh, invariant with respect to the groupoid anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they will not be in the same class. Uh, uh, and their transformation. So this, I will not expect anything, nothing very, very much significant. However, in the case of symmetry breaking, yes, because now group points are, so to speak, the abstraction of the notion of symmetry. So you, you, you see, uh, uh, one of the advantages of, of the main, of the power of using the groupoidal or groupoids in the, as a foundational 
uh, uh, ingredient in the description of quantum theories is that um, they reflect um, the because you see, for instance, groups appear as a symmetry of the theory. Mm -hmm. But for instance, what are the symmetries when you have a space-time which is not flat? I mean, when, when you have a genetic space-time, the group of isometries of such space-time is trivial. Uh, there are no symmetries for a genetic perturbation, for instance, of Minkowski space-time. However, there is there are a natural groupoids corresponding to any space-time. So groupoids are there even if there are no groups of symmetry, because they represent, so to speak, a deeper and more powerful notion of symmetry. In this sense, the notion of symmetry breaking, spontaneous symmetry breaking, will correspond to the choice of states in the von Neumann algebra of the groupoid that will not be equivalent with respect to the action of the groupoid itself. Mm -hmm. So, in this sense, they will provide uh, a, a, a new way of understanding or approaching mm, such kind of non-perturbative phenomena as you are commenting. So, summarizing and making a, a long <laughs> discussion very, very short. Yes, we expect that if we can provide a, mm, uh, a new way, at least of thinking, on such classical and significant, important problems as the ones you are mentioning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, you all. Thank you.